2012 Media Day at Resorts World Las Vegas coming to a close this evening. We had the opportunity to follow Arizona State around the event all day long, and it's been a long one. Nick Borgia, Devil's Digest coming at you, alongside with our publisher, Hode Urbino. And Hode, there was two glaring questions, two elephants in the room, you could say, this morning when we first heard from the commissioner of the Pac-12, uh, one being those new media rights deals that the Pac-12 is negotiating as we speak, and secondly, the legal situation going down in Tucson with Arizona's starting quarterback. Um, what's your take on both those issues as they were addressed today? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, I think there were really two elephants in the room go, going into the event today, and uh, I don't think it was a coincidence that the, they were both uh, done, I think, by 9, 9.30 in the morning. Uh, if, if everything was addressed. Let's start with the uh, Pac-12 Pac uh, Commissioner, George, George Kilikoff. Uh, we basically heard a lot of uh, off uh, the record comments from various university presidents, various universities, athletic directors, that the Pac-12 media deal rights was really uh, progressing at a very, very promising pace, that the revenues were supposed to be very much on par with, with the Big 12. And let's remind everybody, the Big 12 is the only conference that we're hearing about possible poaching. We're hearing about schools from the Pac-12, or soon to be Pac-10, thinking about actually migrating too. So we did hear all these reports that things are really uh, progressing as, as everybody wants them to, but obviously without the Pac-12 media rights deal being signed, sealed and delivered, uh, it's really somewhat of an unknown. Is it gonna happen? When is it gonna happen? And more importantly, when it comes to the dollars and cents, what exactly is that deal gonna be? Now, Pac-12 commissioner said that he did not want to announce the media deal today because he wanted to focus on football. And one of the reporters asked an absolute legitimate follow-up question, okay, does that mean that you do have the, de the deal signed, ready to be delivered and publicized to be announced, I'm not saying tomorrow obviously, but maybe sometime next week when Pac-12 Media Day is behind us. And the Pac-12 commissioner said, I think you're reading too much into my statement. So obviously you can feel the frustration that everybody in the room was uh, witnessing due to that statement. And I'm sure everybody either seeing uh, the uh, Media Day Live or reading the comments were kind of a little confused. Okay, is there a signed media rights deal just ready to be announced You know, sometime next week or just sometime before the season opener for, for the respective teams? Or is it really still st in, in, in the negotiating uh, phases? I like to think, and I said this in the interview earlier, that the Pac-12 commissioner and the presidents and athletic director who, directors who have been talking off, off the record for months now would be very foolish to think that if this was even a 50-50 proposition to really broadcast this optimism. Maybe be a little more, little more cautious with their words. Uh, but just because of what we heard from the Pac-12 commissioner today, I'd like to think the media deal is going to be announced sooner rather than later. I'm not going to be a fool and even give you a timeline at this point, but uh, again, the bottom line, when it comes to the financial impact of this media rights deal, is it going to be equivalent to what the Big 12 is offering its members? Is it going to be less? Is it going to be more? And if it's going to be less than that deal, then I think some programs, whether it be the Four Corner programs, which I guess were rumored for months now, are going to make that move to the Big 12, uh, time will tell. Uh, the second one, and I think it's a much more serious uh, matter, obviously, is uh, Arizona starting quarterback uh, Jaden Delora and the rape case that uh, he's, he's been involved in. It's one of those matters, Nick, where legally he never went to trial and was found guilty, but he did reach a settlement with the victim. He did reportedly make some statements where he did actually admit uh, for the for the allegations actually taking place so Arizona and I'm not saying this you know from any matter of bias or anything are really just hanging on for dear life to that legality that Delora was never found guilty now they also have that um, excuse if you want to call it or that uh, blanket of deniability that they cannot really speak much more on the topic due to the legal ramifications of it. Because when you are reaching a settlement uh, with the victim, just like you're not um, letting the victim really tell their side of the story after the settlement is reached, uh, on, the, on the same token, you can't have Delora or any University of Arizona official really talk about that, that case either, 
other than to say that Jaden Delora was never found in, in, uh, guilty in court. Now, obviously, the Arizona fans are uh, thinking that Delora should play like, like, like nothing never happened. And, you know, I, I can't say that that wouldn't be the case if uh, Delora was starting for any other Pac-12 program, any other program around the country for that matter. But obviously, the optics of this, the public sentiment uh, of this is a, a much, much different narrative than what you're going to hear in Tucson. And Jaden Delora did come over here to the Pac-12 meet today, as I said, to address this. Some people even criticize him being here to begin with. I think that from a you know, public relations aspect, for lack of a better term, he just wanted to address it in front of a big crowd and really just put that matter behind him. And I don't know if Tucson media members are still going to bring up uh, those questions uh, when fall camp starts in Tucson or just later on uh, th throughout the season. But uh, that's something that was addressed today both by Arizona head coach Jed Fish as well as uh, um, Delora itself. And, uh, you know, just a very, very serious case, a very uh, unfortunate case, uh, to, to say the least. And just sometimes, as we all know, in all aspects of lives, if you just have that legal um, life preserver, if, if, you, if you will, just to hang on, and just because legally you are not proven to be guilty, whether it's a horrible case like rape or just much, much minor cases than that, then that's really what you have ultimately. And that's uh, really what the na narrative that, uh, that's put out there. But, uh, you know, very two different elephants of the room, I would say, uh, that, that were addressed today, whether it was addressed to the satisfaction of the people uh, seeing and reading those comments, that might be a whole different issue. All right, well, let's now hone our focus into Arizona State. And you had the chance earlier today to do a one-on-one -on -one with head coach Kenny Dillingham, and we followed him throughout the whole day. You know, everybody that was here spoke to the media probably dozens of times. So um, out of all the things that he said today, was anything really sticking out to you after um, today's events have all been said and done? Yeah, I think I kind of did like not only with the conversation uh, with me one on one, which is already on our front page at uh, DevilsDigest.com. Uh, he, he talked about the team culture and how proud he was that everybody's buy in uh, was uh, pretty quick, whether it's returning players or whether it's a huge group of newcomers. Let's not forget you have approximately 50 newcomers on this Sun Devil team, more than half of them uh, from the transfer portal. They bought in and they bought in quick to what Kenny Dillingham is really trying to establish over here from a team culture perspective. So I think uh, that's uh, something that Dillingham feels that does a really, really big feather uh, in his cap. Uh, the inevitable question about the quarterback race uh, was asked uh, by, some, by several different uh, media members. Can Dillingham said the right thing that it is still wide open. I'm not going to belabor the point what I've said, you know, on camera, on my message board, that I feel that coming out of spring practice, uh, Trent Borgay was the clear leader in that quarterback race. I'm not saying there's no chance that this is going to change, but I do feel that Borgay right here, right now, going into full camp, does have the leg up on, on, on Drew Pine. We'll see uh, what, what takes place um, d during those uh, August sessions because I believe it's not so much only Drew Pine need, really need, needing to ascend to a whole different level and something we haven't seen from him in spring practice, but we also need, I think, Trent Borgate to really regress from what we saw from him in the spring. And it is, I think, almost unfair for Drew Pine because Borgate does have that chemistry with the two main aerial targets on this team, uh, tight end Jalen Conyers, wide receiver Elijah Badger, and that, I think, is definitely one element that definitely falls in Borgay's uh, favor. But overall, again, he was the better quarterback in the spring. I don't think the race is close right now. But, yes, we still have, I think, 15 or so practices in August to really determine that he would actually be, actually be the starting quarterback. But right now, he really is uh, in, in, in a great position. Uh, I also talked to him a little about offensive and defensive line. Uh, there were some definitely key additions uh, done uh, in the transfer portal post spring practice. Two names I, I want you guys to keep in mind. One is offensive lineman, transfer from Purdue, uh, Sione Finau, and uh, the, the def defensive lineman transfer from uh, Michigan State, uh, Deshaun Mallory. If those two guys can really play up to the capabilities uh, that a lot of people on staff think they can play, um, I think there's going to be a lot of questions addressed both on the offensive line and the defensive line. And let's just be clear, we're actually talking about the interior of the defensive line because when it comes to the edge positions, when you talk about a returning player like B.J. Green, when you're talking about transfers like uh, from the, um, Prince Dorba and Clayton Smith, uh, you still have Michael Matus, the, the, the super senior coming back. Uh, there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of talent over there. But if the interior of the defensive line uh, 
become a question mark to actually a, an element that ASU can feel really, really good about. And I think Anthony Cooper is definitely a name uh, to keep in mind also when you talk about that three-tech uh, position. I think Arizona State is really going to sleep much better uh, at, at night knowing that that issue has been addressed. Now I'll ask you a question, Nick. I know that you talked to uh, defensive back Jordan Clark. You talked to tight end uh, Jalen Conyers. What were some of uh, the main points that they actually hit uh, in terms of their uh, personal development uh, during spring as well as, well as their outlook uh, towards fall camp? Well, the number one thing I want to hone in on is the point that you brought up at first is that team culture. And any coach ever is going to say that team culture is so important. Obviously, Dillingham preaches that. Every time we listen to him, he's talking about team culture and camaraderie and being together. Togetherness is one of his favorite words. <laughs> but to see two players who represent that here at Pac-12 Media Day, like, like I said, Coaches say this all the time, but it's really hard to prove that that's what's going on behind the scenes in the locker room, um, you know, in the practice facilities. But you can just tell by talking to these two guys um, how much they mean to each other. They both mentioned how fun it was for them to be together at this event, but also being able to say that they represent the whole team and what they value. Um, it just it's just by talking to them, you can kind of tell. Like there's some some players that'll say different things, like you know they won't things they say aren't checking out or checking out with any any of the other things that the coaches will be saying but it's just it seems like the trio of Kenny Dillingham um, Jalen Conyers and Jordan Clark everything they said this weekend about just how much this culture has changed is just so obvious to me so I was I was touched by that and also just Jordan Clark in particular um, we talked to both Kenny Dillingham and Jordan Clark in both when they're separated they will both say how their competitive nature really they elevate each other um, so I thought that was super interesting and and fun to listen to especially from Jordan Clark just you know hearing all the stories that they'll tell about Kenny Dillingham with his first team meeting um, and even you know telling me like I asked him about how they you know play chess in the locker room and stuff and how Kenny's playing golf with players and he's even on Twitter chirping some of his own players so it's just like it seems to me it's such an obviously healthy relationship that coach has with all these players and it's, it's hard to, to see that and prove that because every coach is going to claim that that's what's going on um, but it's not always so simple to to validate that and I think it's been validated by the experiences that those two guys have had and then on top of that it's just so fun to see those two interact as friends like D Dillingham is um, saying how important it is off the field for players to be inviting you know with each other like new guys hey come over and hang out or transfer players like he wants everybody to be all buddy buddy which again like any coach is going to ask for any coach is going to want um, and granted Jalen Conyers and Jordan Clark have been a part of this program for a pretty long time together now in comparison to a lot of people but just the jokes they were telling each other and the stories they were telling at the different stations I guess where they were um, being interviewed by the media it's just so obvious that um, what they've got going on in Tempe, not just those two, but the rest of their team, it's healthy. They've, it's hard to flip a switch in a, in a head coach change. You know, it usually takes a long time for things to really set in place a team culture to shift. But in my humble opinion, it's, it's very clear that that flip has been switched. And I think it's going to, I think it's going to benefit um, the entire team greatly as they head on to fall camp. So yeah, it was a great time for both of us out here covering this. Uh, the first time it's been in Las Vegas, Nevada, traditionally been in uh, Los Angeles, California. So we've been at Resorts World, uh, pretty crazy venue they've got set up here. I mean, it was it was really special. What do you think about it, Hoden? Yeah, first of all, I mean, d don't take Nick's word for it. Take his B-roll and the packages that he has coming uh, your, your, your way this week and really catching the sights and sounds, uh, doing a great, great job. And uh, yeah, I think... Uh, when you talk about the breath, uh, breath of fresh air with Arizona State program, I think that goes very well hand to hand, hand in hand. I'm sorry, with uh, a new venue like you said for Pac-12 Media Day here in Las Vegas. And make no mistake, this is not a one-off. This is here to stay in Las Vegas. The Pac-12 commissioner is uh, from Vegas, has some very very deep roots over here, and uh, everybody knew from day one that when George Kilikov was uh, hired that that's it this Pac-12 media day is going to be in Las Vegas the Pac-12 uh, football championship game is going to be in 
in the Death Star, aka Allegiant Stadium, that uh, that, that took place too. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, it's a, it's really a really a great uh, a great venue uh, to have this. I mean, I know we're talking to, to the players; uh, they, they definitely really had fun, even though they really didn't. Uh, experience all those Pac-12 media days in Los Angeles in years past, but they were very, very happy uh, with with this experience too. And and again, when I when I, when you talk about this, um, a sense of renewal, at least when it comes to the uh, Pac-12 media day, being in a brand new city and uh, being in a, being in a brand new venue, I think again that goes really. Uh, in concert with what's going on with Arizona State right now. Look, I mean, I know that the games have not been played on the grass yet. And I know that maybe full camp can actually portray a different picture than what we saw in spring practice. But I just feel that the foundation really has been laid uh, in, in spring, both on the field and, and off the field. I know a lot of people have been asking me about the 10th the place uh, um, slotting of the uh, media preseason uh, Pac-12 poll. Do I agree? Do I disagree? And I said and not in a cynical manner that I pretty much expected the Pac-12 media really not to give ASU uh, the benefit of the doubt just because ultimately this is a team that was coming off arguably its worst record ever in program history at, at, at three and nine. So I don't think that ASU built any goodwill, any cachet to really be ranked a whole, a whole lot higher from that. But uh, as I discussed uh, many times already uh, on my message board on various interviews, I think with eight home games, with at least one, maybe two winnable uh, road games, I think this Arizona State team, when it's all said and done, is going to finish nowhere close to the 10th place. And obviously I'm talking about uh, <laughs> better than 10th place and not, not, not worse than that. But uh, again, the, it definitely uh, the burden of proof is, a, is an Arizona State, especially when they have so many newcomers. But like you said, Nick, you, when you have that gelling and that camaraderie really being set off the field, that can only help the on-field product. And uh, you know, we're definitely going to be honest about it. And when we talk about uh, our season recap, sometime uh, in late November, maybe even December, who knows, uh, we're actually going to talk about, okay, all that stuff that we said right now on July uh, 21st, uh, did it really come to fruition on the field? Or maybe it was just like, okay, it's still the preseason, everybody's uh, you know, still, still undefeated, and everybody's just in a certain mindset. But when the rubber meets the road, maybe it was a different question. So uh, that's what's going to make, I think, this season a lot of fun. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, and I know the bar was really low last year, that the anticipation among the Sun Devil Nation is much higher than it was this time last year. Yeah, and it all gets started right at the end of this month. First practice, July 31st. But before that, there's a few more media availabilities that we'll both be at. So. You know what that means. Keep it locked in at devilsdigest.com. Drop a follow at Devil's Digest on Twitter for all the top coverage surrounding Arizona State football. For Hoder Bino, I'm Nick Borgia. We thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.